Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. It's a special Sunday for us this morning here at the church. We have labored hard for three years in the book of Romans to understand it, to see all its connections and tie-ins and to see the glory in it and to, to be transformed by it. I just, I love the gospel. What a season it's been. Those who know me, you kind of know, these moments I get a little meditative and contemplative and nostalgic, so forgive me. (laughs) We journeyed through COVID together in Romans. And some Sundays it was just me and Thomas and Wayne. And we were laboring through Romans chapter 1 and 2, and we were looking at the condemnation of all of humanity that were rightfully condemned before God for our sin. Our nation was falling apart and we were sitting alone in our homes. We finally got to go outside. I'm turned around, but we went outside and I stood on, I think it's called a porch. And you were in the parking lot. And we labored in Romans some more and we saw some beautiful things in Romans chapter three and four. And I'll never forget, I've told you chapter five where Paul says, we rejoice in our tribulations and the wind took my whole tent and just lifted it up and it was stirring all over and we're like, yeah. And then the next Sunday we looked at the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts and it was beautiful sunshine and the birds were chirping and it was just beautiful. We had smoke alerts the whole summer, my asthma was dying. We came inside and then because it got cold, I don't like cold. We tried to faithfully obey God with different convictions as we came in. What to do as a church regarding COVID. People were walking away with differing convictions and longtime friends just leaving. But God brought a unity. It just lifted when we looked at that conscience issue and how do we journey through this. And there became a delight in our differences and rejoicing that everybody in here was trying to obey God with their conscience and all of a sudden they're just unity. And we watched the revival that we've been praying for since we began Romans. We sit here this morning with so many of you just taken up in God and his gospel, magnifying him in all kinds of different trials as you sit here this morning worshiping God. I went through many things Personally, as we journeyed, I'll never forget my threat of a fine or jail for standing and preaching, wanting to humbly and quietly just come back to worship when we decided to come back in. And and then there was a 500 (laughs) caravan of Trump people driving by, honking their horns and waving at us. And I go, there goes being quiet and humble. (laughs) I thought they were here for us. And I found out there was a parade on Arapaho. Trials were abounding. The Rutlands had to bury both parents during that time. I had to bury my dad. And there were just so many hardships going on in the body, health and and death and just hard counseling issues. And COVID took me down hard. On the fourth time, I lost my brain. Some of you thought I did a long time before, but it was COVID. (laughs) I couldn't hold a thought and couldn't counsel, and I had to walk out after I preached. You know what that does to a shepherd's heart? But we just kept climbing together in the Word of God, and we kind of hit this high point in Romans chapter 8. I didn't ever want to come out of it, and we spent a long time in it. I remember sitting down after the last verse, that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, and I just said, "It, it just can't get any higher than that. So reluctantly, I moved on to Romans chapter 9 through 11, saying, how do you get any higher? Israel just doesn't do it for me. God taught me much in it. But but nothing can separate me from the love of God. And knowing that God had to keep his promises, it just solidifies it all the deeper with how he dealt with Israel. And we needed to work that out to just say God is faithful to his promises and there is nothing that can get him to quit bringing you to glory and working in your lives. As we began our exposition of God's word in those chapters, 
I was taken higher to the freedom of God to give glory to whomever he desires. He's free to give this grace and mercy to whoever he chooses. To work out history, his story, in any way that he wants to get the glory. And I remember at my low point, just sick with COVID and my nervous system just was messed up and darkness, saying, why am I doing this? I've never been shot at more in my life. And the answer was just so clear. And the answer is sufficient for anything that you are facing here this morning that you walked in with. That God would get the glory for this. That we would climb the Mount Everest of divine revelation and we would get to the top with all the blood, sweat, and tears and the anguish of this body over the years with so much suffering and get to the top and look out and just worship God. I exalt in my tribulations. I exalt in God. I sing praise to your name, O Most High, that we would have one voice, one heart, and one passion, and everyone in this room would say, to God be the glory forever. Amen. A church who sees the fullness and the beauty of this gospel and worships God for real from the depths of our being. God, you get the glory for this. That every trial and tribulation you're facing, you would cry out, God, I want you to be glorified in this. This is what's just missing in our country. God-inspired truth, studying it and meditating and praying over it, and it ends in just the pure worship of God. Nothing of us. I truly believe if you cut me open at this point, I might bleed Romans. It goes into the heart, and you get overwhelmed with God's ways. And it ends with a a doxology, a delight in God, a mind that understands all that we've studied, and a heart that just delights in what he does, and a will that says, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. That's where all of Romans is moving. This is the heart cry of faith, a heart that overflows and is taken up with God. It's more than just knowing truth. It's got to be more than just knowing truth. And, and we're tempted when we study Romans in detail to just think it's learning truth alone. It's more than just comprehending. You got to taste the truth. That's where Paul's going to go this morning. You got to taste it and say to God be the glory. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Delight in the person of God. This is what Edwards called religious affections. A heart amazed with God. A truth that brings you to doxology. And this will move us then into the practical of obedience of chapters 12 through 16. Worship produces obedience. If you just take uh, indicative statements of facts and go try to live the indicatives, you're going to become a legalist. You're going to die. You're going to come short. You're, You're just sitting here grieving this morning. It's got to lead to worship. And worship will take a heart that will love God more than this passing away world, and now it will begin to move out to love and please and obey this God. This is the glue that holds it all together, and we want to skip it. Our lives are the overflow of worship. And so I want you to come with me this morning and sing. I'm the worship leader this morning. And I'll tell you what, my voice is off key, but my heart, tune my heart to sing that praise. Let's go worship God. If you'll look with me in Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that every heart is sitting in this seat where Paul is this morning. I pray that the things that we've been looking at for three years 
have brought our hearts to worship God and God alone. Lord, I pray for those who just see this glory in their beginning to lose their life for the King. And I pray for those this morning with cataracts, that the cares and the worries of this world have begun to cloud out this view that Paul has this morning. You're the spiritual surgeon. Cut them out. By your spirit and your word this morning, let us see clearly the glory of God in such a way that I say, therefore, I offer up my body a living sacrifice to God. Will you do that in our midst? That's our prayer. That's our request. Father, and if there's any who are just spiritually blind, let there be light. Speak light into their darkness this morning and let them see the glory of the gospel to where they sit and join Paul in worship of their God. God, you know every heart and I'm asking you to do the specific work in each and every one. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's worship. Let's take up Paul's song. Let's join the chorus. My goal is not to take the song out of this passage. I read a man who preached a sermon on every word, and at the end of it, the song was taken out of it. He exegeted the song right out of this passage. I spent the week at a preaching conference, and the teacher said, every sermon needs rooms that you divide up the main point into. And my first chance to stand up and give you rooms, I feel led to not even have an outline. Aren't you glad I go to conferences? I don't think songs of praise should be put in a technical outline. But if I did, it would be, first point is, oh. And the second one is, how. And the third one is, who. Look in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Paul sits on the peak of a mountain And he's looking out, wearier than any one of us ever will be, beaten, just tired. I've only been on the top of four 14ers, three I drove up. (laughs) Laura, Laura actually did, I'm afraid of heights. That's embarrassing. But when you get to the top, driven or climb, climbing's better. It's so sweet to just, this is why people do it. They look out and you see things that you'll never see in a car and you just go, wow. It's what makes the pain sweet and the climbing worth it. I got a picture of some friends in this church who made a little hike. I don't know if we can pull it up or not. Oh, that's beautiful. And I just, all I could think of is, I don't think that's what Paul's talking about right there. I think that was me in Romans 11, scared to death of falling off the cliff on either side. I I picture more that that one that they didn't go up. It's a little higher. And I just picture a flat seat and you're just looking out. And you see more of his glory. And you need to sit down now. And I need you to take time this week, especially, and just stop. And I want you to look at the scenery. Go read through Romans 1 through 11 again on your own. Just look your eyes out and worship. Paul gives us these exclamations of amazement. He's speechless, it feels like. And so maybe the question is, has the gospel ever made you speechless? We saw last week it was to shut us up, just to make us speechless before God and to just worship. So I want to begin with our first word, oh, oh. The depth. The Greek word means a great or extreme degree of anything. It's inexhaustibility. It really emphasizes the fathomless and the character of it. And Paul just looks out and says, oh, the depth of God, the deep things of God, the depth of his way of salvation. This is why I just start Romans. Every time I finish it, I start again somewhere. 
because I see it deeper and sweeter every time, and I just want to look again and again. I've had someone say, what's your favorite climb? It's this one. It's this one. It's my favorite hike, and I never get tired of the view at the top. And so I want you this morning to look at what composed so great a salvation. The depth of God's riches he owns everything in Deuteronomy 10, 14. He, he made everything out of nothing. He's his own infinitely valuable treasure. There's just riches and glory and transcendence and worth in God. And then in Ephesians 3, 8, the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's endless, the richness of our Savior. And so just the riches of who he is, and then the riches that we've seen that he bestows on us in mercy. And so just, oh, the depth of the riches of this gospel and God and what he gives us and what he brings us into. The wisdom and the knowledge of God. God's knowledge is in perfection. We study the attributes of God. They just finished up. And his attribute, he knows infinitely all things. He knows it exhaustively and truly. God never learns anything. He knows all events at a micro level and at a galactic level. He knows all choices, all feelings, all the past, all the present, all the future, all of history, the facts, the events. He knows how all things affect each other, small and large. Our God is omniscient. The depth of his knowledge. Come worship at it. And his wisdom is you can have great knowledge and not know what to do with it. I heard of a medical student, he memorized every book, he was a genius, and he could do nothing with a patient before him. Many of us know all the books of the Bibles and can outline them. Do you have wisdom to know how to walk in the ways of God? God's perfect knowledge is joined with perfect wisdom. He knows what to do with all of his knowledge and how to direct that knowledge to the highest and most moral ends, which this morning is his glory. His perfect wisdom has guided all of this in absolute knowledge and wisdom that he would get all the glory for this. His wisdom selected the proper ends and the proper means for all the accomplishment of those ends. And so Paul's just looking at all that he wrote inspired by the Holy Spirit and he just marvels and says, oh, the depth of the wisdom and the knowledge of God to work history so gloriously to show mercy to all, there's no bottom to it. And I pray that you have felt something of that in our journey through Romans. Oh, the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So Paul is full-voiced. What a perfect plan of his riches, wisdom, and knowledge that God has worked out. And so are we amazed at the depth of them? And then he moves to how. How unsearchable are his judgments. It's a beautiful word, unsearchable, uh, impossible to search out, unfathomable. Judgments is an interesting word. It means God's judicial decisions. And sometimes his determinations, his, his right and wrong, what he determines on this earth, how unsearchable are the judgments of God. It's impossible to search out his decrees and his judgments. Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Pharaoh, I hardened his heart for my glory. I, I hardened Jews to bring in Gentiles. I hardened Gentiles for Jews. I'm showing mercy and I'm hardening. It's his actions in history, what God decides and what he does. They're unsearchable. The surprising ways that he exercises grace and mercy, I'm stunned on it by a daily basis. So I want you to hear this. There's nothing random or capricious that God does. He has a purpose in everything, and this morning, he shows what it is. Everything is for his glory. Everything is working that God would get the glory and the praise and the honor. How unfathomable are his ways? Here's another interesting word. It meant tracking out. It was to catch an animal. Now, this one I can honestly say I've never done. I've never hunted Tell me if this is right, Robert. Catching an animal, you got to find a track and you follow it until you come to the animal. So the hardest part about hunting is you got to find a track. Is that true? No. Possibly. So that's why they like when it snows. They can find a track a little easier. I'm so out of bounds here. Let's just go back. <laughs> God's ways are untrackable. Who can figure out God? <laughs> 
Our minds can't stretch enough. They're not broad enough to figure out God. There's just worship. You'll never end at an end. His ways go on and on for infinity. His ways can't be tracked out. That's one thing I get from reading this Bible. I look at genealogies and I'm like, you can't figure God out. It's an interesting, the noun means footprint. A footprint. As we look at the sandy beach of all of history, you see how untraceable the footprints of God are. Abraham, I'm going to bless you, but not in this lifetime. And I'm going to give you children at age 100. Moses, you're going to deliver the people. You kill an Egyptian and you spend 40 years as a shepherd in a desert. At 80, you lead Israel out and you wander in the wilderness for 40 years. You hit a rock and you don't get to enter into the promised land. How unsearchable are his ways. He sends his son into the world to save it and he comes in poor, hated and ends up on a cross and does the greatest accomplishment in the human of history. Paul beaten and persecuted and rejected, persecution that came on the early church, that long dark ages, and then the wild bull out of Germany came forth. The tinker's son, Bunyan in prison, and he writes one of the greatest literary pieces known to man, Pilgrim's Progress. His, his ways are past finding out. I was thinking, how would I send my son into the world? I would have brought him into a palace, not a stable. I would have sent him to the greatest schools, not a carpenter. And the power that saved the world was an utter weakness hanging on a cross, dying. This message isn't made known through great philosophers and persuasive words. It's through the foolishness of preaching. And even though I can't trace the footprints of God then, what we're learning is I can trust him. One man said, I don't have a handle on God. He has a handle on me. And so I want you to come this morning and just say how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. And now Paul's going to shift. He's lost in God. And now he's going to come and he's going to look at the poverty of man's small knowledge in light of who God is. And so looking at God gives us perspective of ourselves. And we need to do this often. For who has known the mind of the Lord? And this is the knowledge. Who's known the mind of God? The more man speaks, the more we know about their ignorance of God. Who thinks he knows as God knows? The answer is no one. And Job, why am I suffering? The whole book back and forth trying to talk about what's fair, what isn't, why is God acting this way? And God gives Job 84 questions. In Job 38, he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth and measured out the waters? And he he says, I have no answer. I repent in dust and ashes. I can't understand how every molecule is chained to the will of God and man is completely responsible in everything that he does. I see both ropes going up to heaven and I know they're perfectly woven together and we've labored in that. But I just stand here this morning saying, I don't know. I stand in awe of the mind of God. And the question that we probably need to ask ourselves, who became his counselor? His wisdom is infinite. If you go to a counselor, you expect wisdom. You want help. You want suggestions. You want insight. Who's going to give God counsel how to run things? We're, We're always giving God advice. That's our favorite thing. Tell him how to run things, what would be better. Give him some information. We're always counseling God. He said, who became God's counselor? Don't mock infinite wisdom and knowledge with our little puniness going, God, let me counsel you. Let me tell you how to run my life. Who are you, O Anthropos, who talks back to Theos? Our suggestions as the way to salvation are foolish. Our suggestions as to the way of providence are always wrong. Who has become God's counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? It's been this whole gospel. Man has nothing to give to God. We have no wisdom and we have no knowledge to help him. And we have no righteousness to get ourselves in a right standing with him. There's none righteous, not even one. You can never hear this. You can never put God in your debt. 
You can't put him in your debt. I'm going to live a certain life, so he has to bless me. I'm going to do certain things, so he has to save me. You cannot put this God in a debt where he has to save you. Bow your knee onto that this morning. He will never owe anybody anything. You don't put God in, in your debt. And I just want to park on the conclusion this morning. So the conclusion from all these three years is for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Guys, this is what we're going to call a paradigm shift. And what I want you to see this morning as we close out, this is what salvation is. And it's going to be probably too clear for some of you. It's going to hurt. And we need to look at it. Because this is where Paul's been driving this whole epistle. And we started in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So every unbeliever, our great sin is we lack the glory of God. And we were made for him. We were made to put him at the center of everything, to love him, to worship him, to trust him, to obey him. We are made for that. And the fall comes and we come in now with self-glory. Everything's about me, from me, through me, and to me. It's all about me. And so there's nothing that can break that. There's nothing that can take a human from being self-centered, self-glory seeking, wanting everything to be a nothing can break that. Religion and morality can't fix that heart. There's only one thing that can. That's what we saw and the work of Jesus Christ. And when you see that with the eyes that God gives you, something mighty happens. And so when I was unsaved, everything was about my pleasure, my thoughts, my goals, my strength. That was all I lived for. Daniel 4.30, Greg just finished it up this morning. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, reflected and said, is this not Babylon the Great? which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for my glory of my majesty. This is from him. I've built it. It's through me. It's by the, my, my power. And it's unto me the glory of my majesty. That's depravity. That's the way we all come into this world. From me, through me, and to me are all things. To Ken Murphy be the glory. That's how you're born. And in Daniel 4.34, this is what happens when God steps in. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I raised my eyes toward heaven. I looked to where I should, and my reason returned to me. I quit reasoning like an animal. And I started thinking again, looking at God. And I blessed the Most High God and praised and honored Him who lives forever. I gave God the glory. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say, what hast thou done? And so guys, this is what we're looking at. The gospel is a paradigm shift. It's not just taking up a new set of beliefs or changed behavior. I'm going to live this way instead of that way. It's going from this depravity of death that I live for my glory. And when I see this gospel, it takes up my heart. And now from him, through him, and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. Amen. Now you get it. You get what this is all about and you're restored into a relationship with God. And justified means to be made right. And you think right about God and life in this world. That's what salvation does. John Murray said, God is the source of all things and that they have proceeded from him. He's the creator. And he's the agent through whom all things subsist and are directed to their proper end. And he is the last end to whose glory all things will redound. So I want to look at these three prepositional phrases. Many of you have gone through this little thing with me before, but you're going to do it again this morning. Let's picture a circle up here, and there's three prepositions. One is ek, dia, and ace. 
And he says, those are what all things are for, and I want to go through them. The first one, if you look at the circle Ek, everything comes, so it comes out from the source. So everything, everything comes from God. It comes, this circle's God. And Ek, everything comes from him. In the beginning, God. God is the source of everything. He is the one that all creation flowed from. He set the stars, the sun, the moon, the rivers, all the intricacies, humans, the purpose, the flow of history, everything that exists comes from him. Nothing existed that did not exist. So everything from God, everything has its source from him. Every, anything that I have this morning is from him, my salvation, my family, my health, everything is from him. And then Dia is through him. Everything is through him. He is the agency. God is the source of everything. If you learned anything in Romans, God is the source. He's the one directing it all. How are you sustained? How, how will Romans 8 happen? Because God is the source. He's the source that will bring you to glory. Why do you love anyone? Because God's the source. We love because he first loved us. Why do I persevere? Because God's the source. Why do I pray? Why do I read? Why did I take a breath and wake up today? Because God is the source. It's all through him. Hebrews 1, 2, in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. And then the last preposition is to go back into the circle, to, to be plunged back in. So it all comes from him. Everything is through him, and everything is to him. It's the end of the circle. Everything in history leads back to God and his glory. And when you do a study on that, I, I studied everything that happened in the history of this world. It says it was done for his glory. My glory I won't give to another. Everything exists, ace, to God. Everything that has been made or happens is to display his glory. He's the end of everything. We're not the focus of heaven. He is. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will, will also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all and all. So we exist to make much of God, to proclaim his excellencies. Salvation, we saw, was his choosing, his calling, his justifying, and him glorifying us. It's all of grace. Everything we've learned in Romans was from him and through him and to him. It's God. He's the object of it all. So I ask you, does your salvation bring you to doxology? Did you just mark up a notebook? Or do you worship God for what he's done for you in Jesus Christ? That's what this gospel does. That's where Paul has been bringing us. It can't just be academic. This has got to be worship of God. Do you know any of this in your heart? What really drives you? What really is your chief end sitting here before God who knows all things? I have so many people adding Jesus to their life and living for their own glory in everything that they do. I just want Jesus so I can get more of what I want to get out of this life. Come to Jesus. To him be the glory forever. That's where Romans has been going for three years. 
And that's the place that every heart must land this morning. It's when you get this gospel, here's my heart, God. You're going to be everything I live for now. Take my life and let it be. The days that I have are, are yours. And I battle remaining sin. Yes, I do, but I have a whole new perspective. Sin grieves me because it's, it's a lesser glory. It's, it's, it's exchanging God for lesser things and thinking something else will make me happy. When God say, I know right now, with no temptations, just clear view, God is what makes me happy. God is everything. Everything's for him, from him, to him. That's it. It's for God. That's the place we need to come to. Three years of fighting in Romans. And this morning, Paul is bringing you to a place and a point. And it's uncomfortable, but he wants you to stand this morning and say, what's the last word in Romans 11? Amen. Amen. This is true. And I don't want you to just nod with academic knowledge and say, yep, I see how all the parts work. I want you to say amen. God is worthy of all glory in my life now is for that name, to make much of him, to live for him, to trust him, to please him, to, to have others come into that glory, to leave self-glory for God's glory. That's where this dear apostle is leading us this morning. Can you say to God be the glory forever? And my life, that's what my life is. Because some of you are secretly sitting here and your glory is a girlfriend and you'll give anything to have it. And some of you just want to climb the corporate ladder and you'll do anything, you'll lie, you'll cheat, you'll do whatever it takes. And when you get to the top, you'll say, all glory be to God. And this is bringing us to a head. What is your bottom and your top? To God be the glory. Do you say amen to this like a Baptist? I got saved in a Baptist church and there was this one sweet lady who yelled amen 73 times. He would just say, turn to the book of Romans, amen. You'll say, and the first word is Paul, Amen. And everything was amen, and it didn't even tie into truth. Do you just say amen like that this morning? Amen. Or do you say amen? This is the truth. From him, through him, and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Do you confess after these three years that you are nothing, you're vile, you're a hell-deserving sinner, you are incapable of fixing anything in you, you can't change your nature, you can't change your heart, you can't change your record, you can't change anything? Do you sit here in that this morning, looking only to the grace of God in Jesus Christ, who died the death that you deserved on that cross, and perfectly lived the life of righteousness in your place? Those aren't just doctrines. Those are your life. Do you look at those and say, to God be the glory? I'm afraid too many in the American church can't say amen. And I don't want anyone that I'm shepherding to not be able to say amen this morning. That's what I've been fighting for for three years. A unified amen. Do you still just want to add your little ditties to this gospel? Are you still standing and fighting the freeness of God to do as he pleases? Are you still trying to counsel him? Do you still sit in the seat of God and want to control your life? Do you pat yourself on the back for anything in your salvation? If so, you haven't said your amen yet. And I need an amen out of all of you this morning. Not in the old way. <laughs> Have you just added Christ to your self-centered seeking life? Or has he become your life? A great transformation will cause you to be born again and to take up to God be the glory alone. Amen. 
So I owe all to the grace of God. It's all of Him. It's by His doing that I'm in Christ Jesus. He's my all and all. He's the glory. So the driving question is quite simple and it has to be answered before I let you go. All that you've heard through Romans 1 through 11, has it turned you from Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and lack the glory of God? Has this gospel set you free from the bondage of just living for your own glory? Has it brought you to Romans 11.36? For from him and through him and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. Again, Christianity is not just taking up a new set of beliefs, a new moral system. It's going from death to life, from the dominion of sin to, to where glory is everything, the dominion of Christ to where his glory is all. If anyone were to follow you around for just a day, what would they say drives you? Has the great miracle of the new birth happened in your heart through Romans or before? Can you sit with me this morning on the top of the cliff and say, for from him and through him and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. And you can yell out, amen. Now we can go on to Romans 12 through 16 and we can live in such a way that God will get the glory for our lives. You skip this and you'll never get there. So now we're next time, we're two weeks, we're going to look at therefore in Romans 12. And one, when it's finally, I praise God and I worship him and he gets all the glory for this gospel. Therefore, the mercies of God, I offer up my body a living sacrifice. That is where transformed lives come from and change lives. Dead doctrine, just external religion. You'll never get to what we're going to be studying. You're just dying here and you're full of guilt and shame. And I just hold up Jesus Christ who can save you from this self-glory, idolatry, living for your own pleasures, using God. You can be set free this morning. Jesus is saying, come, are you weary and heavy laden? You tired of self-glory, trying to live a fake Christian life? Come and I'll give you rest for your soul. And your, my yoke, you'll put on you because now my glory will be everything and all you want to do is take the days that you have and live for the glory of God. I love the gospel. <laughs> all right. I knew some of you weren't going to like me this morning, but you got to deal with this because I had to all week. <laughs> I close with one last illustration and we'll go to the table. When we began, I quoted you a commentator named Robert Haldane. Robert Haldane was an uh, instrument that God used in the revival in Geneva and Switzerland. 1815, Haldane visited Geneva, and he met some young students who were theology students, and he invited them to come to his room twice a week for Bible studies uh, on Romans. And he realized very quickly that none of these men were saved. And from these young men in that little room... Revival broke out. I'm praying for that right here when they got this. And I want you to hear what Haldane wrote about this passage. He said, There was nothing that brought under the considerations of the students of divinity who attended me at Geneva, which appeared to contribute so effectually to overthrow their false system of religion that was grounded on philosophy and vain deceit as the sublime sublime view of the majesty of God in the four concluding verses of Romans 11. Of him and through him and to him are all things. He said, here God is described as his own last end in everything that he does. And he said, judging of God as such a one as themselves, they were at first startled at the idea that God must love himself supremely and infinitely more than the whole universe. <laughs> they struggled with that thought. And consequently, he must prefer his own glory to everything else besides. God loves his glory more than anything else. That's what all of history is pointing to. But when they were reminded that God in reality is infinitely more amiable and more valuable than the whole creation 
And thus, consequently, if he views things as they really are, he must regard himself as infinitely worthy of being more valued and loved. They saw this truth was (laughs) uh, unbelievable. And they realized it has to be for him. And their attention was at the same time directed to numerous passages of Scripture which assert that the manifestation of the glory of God is the great end of creation and that he has himself chiefly in view of all of his works, all of his dispensations, and that it is a purpose in which he requires that all his intelligent creatures should acquiesce and seek to promote that glory as their first and paramount duty. My highest end is to seek his highest end the glory of Almighty God. And that is my prayer for the three years of this amazing letter, is your first and paramount duty is to promote the glory of God because of this glorious gospel. Has God himself and his salvation taken the chief seat in your desires, your ambitions, your goals, and your pursuits? That's bigger than did I walk an aisle? Did I get baptized? Has the glory of God taken up your heart? I pray that it's brought you to this sweet place, the highest and sweetest place with the best view that I have ever seen, the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, I come before you, and I've been just looking my eyes out at this. You are glorious. You are right to work all things to this end. It would be sin if you worked it to any other end. And it's for our blessing and good that you worked it toward this end. God, we are recipients of mercy because of your beautiful plan. And we we just acknowledge here as one mind and voice, we brought nothing to the table but sin. And you brought everything for what you did in Jesus Christ to bring about redemption. And now we hold out an empty hand and we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. God, thank you for all that you've done in our midst these three years. We couldn't have asked for anything more. And let it be unified now with these hearts together. You get all the glory for this. Amen.